All right, thank you, Ali. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Uh, at Temple, we are delighted with our partnership with the uh, Riga Graduate School of Law. And I do want to give a special thank you to Yeba uh, Rasanaja, who's here today, who's been just a great friend and supporter of our program. And of course, we're delighted to host uh, Professor uh, Ivan for in today's, uh, or Professor Indars for today's, uh, uh, today's talk. Um, Professor uh, Indars did visit Temple uh, with the ambassador of Latvia in December uh, and, uh, offered to speak on this very important topic uh, when, we, uh, when we met. And I'm delighted that we've been able to put this uh, program together. And a special thank you to Professor Hollis, uh, who teaches international law here at Temple for joining us, uh, as well as to my colleagues in the Office of Graduate International Programs. Uh, I see that Karen, Joel, Felicity, and Ali are all here. And, and thank you for your support of this event. And of course, I give a special welcome to all of the students uh, at, here at Temple. Uh, this is co-sponsored by the International Law Society uh, and to the students at Riga Graduate School of Law. We are so happy to see you here. And through our new partnership with uh, Riga, we do welcome you to uh, come to Temple uh, in the future. And I look forward to the opportunity to meeting all of you personally. Uh, so uh, I'm going to turn the program now over to Joe O'Connell who is a law student here at Temple uh, and in the International Law Society, uh, speaks Russian and has long had an interest in this matter. Uh, and I know that, uh, that Joe and uh, Ivars have met already to uh, prepare today's program. Uh, so Joe, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Professor Smigul. And thank you again, uh, Professor Evans, for coming to speak with us. We really, really appreciate it, uh, obviously, especially in this unfortunate time, but thank you very much uh, for taking the time to talk with us. Um, I guess I, I just wanted to start with, um, and we had discussed this, if you could give us a brief um, overview about the way uh, the Russian identity is perceived in history versus how it's perceived in not only the United States, but the entire Western world, and how their perception of themselves radically affects and determines what's going on right now. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, yeah, thank you for uh, this opportunity. This is a uh, interesting project for both for for uh, Latvians and Americans. And yeah, good afternoon, American students, and good evening, Latvian students. Uh, it's interesting we have this time dif uh, time uh, difference, uh, but I hope uh, we'll, we will manage. Uh, well, I will start with kind of a brief, um, brief overview on uh, Russian threat perception, which is uh, analyzed both from uh, official strategies, documents like military doctrine, uh, like uh, Russia's security strategy, uh, media, uh, uh, public speeches. Uh, the most famous kind of uh, speech is uh, Mr. Putin's uh, Munich conference speech um, uh, in back to 2007. Uh, then the speech uh, after Crimea, uh, Valdai speeches. So it's kind of uh, the source of uh, my assessment is based on, on different sources. And I will try to kind of just summarize uh, the key elements of uh, Russian threat perception. Um, and uh, history definitely plays very, very significant role. But also before I start, it's important to mention that this is a threat perception uh, by Russian current elite, by those decision makers who are like-minded people, uh, who most of them who got, who received uh, education in Soviet times, they still have kind of Soviet time mentality and the Cold War perception. Uh, so if we would make a threat assessment in a wider, uh, wider elite, it probably would be much different. And also uh, if we uh, analyze public opinion uh, in Russia, well, uh, it also would be much more different. But uh, just because uh, 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 Russian regime is uh, 
um, so authoritarian, it's 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 more interesting and more uh, important is to look what what they perceive, what is kind of their kind of threat perception. And uh, I will start with the kind of the number one point is that uh, Russia is surrounded by potential enemies. This is something what uh, uh, Russian elite really believes, uh, and uh, even. Well, in, in Russian, uh, the word security uh, is bezopasnost, which means that uh, uh, defining bezopasnost, it means without threats. So from a Russian, uh, even from linguistic point of view, they see that uh, security means that there are no threats around you. And uh, this, this is because Russia, Russia feels that it's surrounded by potential enemies. Even if the, the countries, the neighboring countries, they might be friendly, they might cooperate with Russia, but uh, in a certain way, uh, Russian elite has certain suspicions on uh, all uh, countries surrounding Russia. And uh, this has been case actually already from 90s, because a good example is that Russia had the border disputes with uh, most of its neighboring countries. So this is because uh, the feeling of this that they are surrounded by enemies. Uh, this, the next uh, point, which is very important, that the main enemy of Russia is the United States. And the United States of America is using uh, proxies uh, to surround and weaken Russia. And uh, in this case, in a Russian elite mindset, uh, European Union, European institutions, um, NATO allies, they play this proxy role of the United States. And uh, this is, well, I would say this is a legacy of the Cold War thinking. Uh, also, certain disappointment of 90s, because there were high expectations that uh, uh, Americans will help kind of to build Russian economy and, and uh, Russians will, will get uh, kind of American prosperity. Uh, in and uh, it didn't happen. So both these factors, those sentiments, now are played against uh, Americans. And the third one is uh, is about history. Um, you know, there is a different perceptions of history. In um, in uh, Buddhism term, for example, uh, well, yesterday is gone, uh, tomorrow is unknown, so we have to enjoy today. Uh, there is also saying that. It's maybe the case for Western societies and for Americans that happy people don't have history. Uh, we have kind of to live today. We have to build our future, uh, and uh, that's kind of philosophical issue whether future starts today or future will be, will be uh, sooner or later. But just kind of the, the mindset of Western society is towards the future. In case of Russia, it's different. Uh, in case of Russia, they they consider that the history is the best teacher. We have to kind of understand our history. We have to live through the history. Uh, we have to be proud of our history. We have to um, kind of, uh, yeah, make lessons learned from our history. And uh, uh, this is a reason why uh, Russians are so um, suspicious to the West, because from a Russian point of view, all the threats historically have come uh, from uh, from the West. Uh, um, well, I, I will mention Napoleon, so France, uh, Sweden, Nazi Germany, Americans uh, during the Cold War. So uh, th this is why this uh, anti-Western perception is so, so important because this is what Russian elite has learned from our history. And it doesn't matter that there is a changes of elites, changes of uh, governments, changes of uh political agenda issues but still uh history plays very important role there is even joke about uh putin that uh, one of the key questions is who are the main consultants or advisors of putin and the answer is that there are two advisors uh, the Ivan the terrible and the peter the great uh but uh, there is kind of uh, okay it's a joke but but still, it plays a very important role in the in mindset of Russian elite. And also, 
uh, the famous Putin speech before a war against Ukraine, uh, he paid, I, I think, more than 40 minutes of his speech. Uh, he talked about the history, about the history of Ukraine, about history of Russian-Ukrainian relations. Okay, that was his interpretation, but it's important to say that, well, this is, this is really how, how they perceive things and history is very, very important. The next point is that uh, uh, Russia is isolated and have few or no allies that they can trust. And this is, uh, this is why so-called international organizations led by Russia are so weak and actually they are not, not significant. The problem is that Russians consider, well, okay, uh, those are organizations kind of to, to, to build something similar against the European Union or NATO, but uh, again, this Russian perception that uh, um, you can't trust your, your partners actually work against them. Uh, the fifth point is about geopolitics. This is something again, and this comes from, again, from history that everything is interpreted as a power struggle. And this approach and the kind of Marxist anal analysis fit great together, but it has been revived and in, in, intervened with Russian nationalism instead. It's the, during the Soviet time, it was Marxism. Uh, now it's kind of Russian nationalism. But uh, geopolitics is very impor important. And again, this is why, for example, Ukraine is so, so, so important for, for Russia's security, because geopolitically, it means that uh, this is a Russian sphere of interest and Russia will be safe from potential uh, attack from the West. Uh, another point is a zero sum game. That means that all interaction is viewed as a zero sum game. There is no win-win solution exists exist, uh, from a Russian perspective. So that makes kind of Russia a very difficult partner because, uh, and this is Putin's personal also opinion that, uh, that any compromise is a sign of weakness. So that's why we have to be kind of uh, demanding and asking as much as possible. Um, uh, another important point is uh, that as good as all internal political opposition are seen as proxies, uh, the fifth column for foreign powers. And uh, this is why uh, internally uh, repressions against opposition uh, are increasing because they see that this uh, might be kind of, again, uh, some uh, kind of geopolitical interest of Americans to support uh, opposition groups. And uh, the last one, but not, not the least, uh, well, the main threats are color, so-called color revolutions, uh, and uh, which lead kind of, okay, they might lead to democratic changes, but uh, from a Russian point of view, uh, that also lead to the lack of order and stability. And colored rev revolutions is something what um, Putin is afraid, and he has seen it in, in Ukraine, in Georgia, in, a number, in, in, in Kyrgyzstan. So we, we have seen those, at least some elements of um, uh, so-called revolutions, uh, col color revolutions. And this is something what uh, makes him very, very um, afraid of the similar scenarios in Russia. And uh, so the political implications of this Russia threat perception is a much more aggressive foreign policy uh, which now we, we, well, we can see kind of an extreme point as it's uh, open aggression against a neighboring uh, country, Ukraine, and increasing repressions against uh, uh, any opposition. And it doesn't matter whether, in, in nowadays in Russia, it doesn't matter whether you politically agree or disagree. You have to kind of be um, loyal to the regime and even our organizations protecting, uh, uh, well, pro protesting against uh, uh, climate change or, or, or uh, green organizations or whatever. It doesn't matter. Even if they don't have political demands, they are dangerous from the regime point of view because sooner or later they can bring, uh, bring some changes, instability and change of the regime. So these are kind of the key, the key points I wanted to share 
uh, about the Russian Russian threat perception and and yeah, I'll be I'll be happy to answer the questions and 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 focus more maybe on on, on current current events. Yes, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to uh, use the Zoom function to raise your hand, or you could chat them to me directly, and I'll make sure they get asked. Uh, we have a question right here, uh, Constantis. Uh, yes, actually, um, the question is about term uh, terms used by Russian politicians about the war. They prefer not to use war war uh, word uh, war. They use this term special operation. And uh, what is the point of such changes? Is there some uh, legal uh, status, special legal status of it, or it just to show, to trying to show that they're peaceful? Yeah, thank you for that's a very good question, actually. Uh, uh, and uh, Russia and Russian people. Uh, they know what war means. Actually, they have suffered uh, uh, from from various wars, and uh, and um, I would say that even Putin's propaganda have uh, has used uh, wars as elements actually to mobilize uh, people to mobilize Russian society. So the war is very sensitive term, and. Uh, I think uh, from a regime point of view, it, it's, uh, it's not just a playing with the words, but it's just kind of uh, to avoid any uh, potential protests in society uh, that, uh, that would be unacceptable that Russia has started a war, even if it's uh, uh, from a Putin's point of view, justified war, but still the wording war is very sensitive in Russia. and. Uh, also, as a result of uh, intense uh, propaganda for many years, uh, because uh, again, historically, Russia always kind of remembers all the wars, all the victims. So this is very sensitive uh, part of identity. And I think that's why uh, they, from a Kremlin point of view, that's uh, kind of a right decision actually to avoid as much as possible using the word uh, war. Uh, we have a question that just came in here. So there's this notion that throughout history for, for in the past, it was czars to be immortalized. They must expand the borders of Russia and create these um, regions of influence around uh, what was Rus. Is this war now serving to cement Putin's place in history? Does he see it that way? Or is it that he sees legitimate national security concerns that he has to address uh, for the Russian state? Which one plays more of a role, the, a, a legitimate concern in his mind, or is it his place in history? Well, thank you. That's that's a very good question. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, from a Russian threat perception, this is kind of legit le legitimate uh, um, policy, kind of to to respond to the developments in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine's integration process, although slow, but still process towards European Union and uh, NATO, even if the formal membership has not, not been on, on agenda, but still uh, integration to the kind of Western, Western organizations. From a Russian point of view, this is a kind of, uh, uh, well, a legitimate response. On the other hand, uh, and this might be kind of side effect of, uh, of uh, coronavirus and uh, President Putin's personal isolation uh, from uh, a lot of political activities. Uh, he gets older, he gets kind of more isolated. Uh, it's, it's, it seems that he is uh, Involving and engaging with only with those people who are like-minded or who have kind of uh, positive reporting to him. Uh, so I wouldn't exclude that there is also increasing uh, will of Putin to become kind of uh, a part of uh, Russian history, and this is something uh, reuniting uh, uh, the big Russia. Uh, I mean, Russia and Ukraine. 
this is kind of attempt to to be part of the history but i would say well i would say still the 70 percent is a response to threat perception and 30 percent would be kind of attempt uh, to become part of history do you see that in in this current conflict what are some of the reasons and i'm sure being an authoritarian state has to do with it but how how does it seem that the, the russian army grossly miscalculated how long it was going to take them to achieve their objectives uh there has been talk that we know uh that has dropped over their uh radio communications that they've had to alter plans or change objectives uh, and then we hear that even Russian conscripts didn't even know that they were going into Ukraine. They thought they were going on a training exercise. What what were some of the the key developments that caused the Kremlin to to completely miscalculate at least the initial few weeks of this this war? Uh, I would say the problem is like like in many authoritarian countries, this is a problem of positive reporting, and uh, I'm sure that. Uh, Russian intelligence services, military, they have capabilities uh, to have objective information. But uh, because of the way Russian government, Russian decision making, and especially uh, regarding security is organized, uh, well, you have to please your, your boss, you have to please your president. And uh, for many years, uh, this is something uh, kind of, uh, that, that's the way actually Russian government was, was misled. Uh, and uh, they, I, I, I think they believed that Ukrainian reaction uh, to Russian aggression, uh, invasion would be similar like in 2014, uh, like Crimea is a good example. Uh, Russians made a number of uh, public surveys uh, before March 18. Uh, and they realized that uh, actually the identity of people of Crimea is kind of typical post-Soviet identity. And it's more kind of uh, pro-Russian rather than pro-Ukrainian. And that's why they considered, well, okay, if, uh, if in Crimea it worked for 90% and, and, and there were no resistance at all, Donbass is a little bit different, but still um, majority of those uh, separatist territories uh, were, well, not pro-Ukrainian, uh, but, well, they, 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 they supported uh, Russian politics. They expected something similar now that Ukrainians, and actually, again, if you, if you look at the public surveys, most of Ukrainians, especially in the eastern part, uh, they, they, they were not satisfied with Ukrainian a government with Ukrainian president with Ukrainian uh, politics, uh, and I think they miscalculated reading those public surveys, uh, ignoring other information, uh, just uh, and they assumed that just because you don't like Ukrainian president, uh, it will be much it, it will be easier for Russians uh, to come in and to change the government, and this is where they failed. Do you think, do you see that if, as a potential end to this war, um, as you said earlier, he, uh, President Putin is, any concession that he makes in an agreement he sees, and he's afraid his people will see as a sign of weakness. But if he's able to go home with even a small victory, do you think he would accept Donbass and Luhansk being independent or, or semi-autonomous states with the retention of Crimea as part of Russian territory, would that be enough for him? And on the other hand, would Ukraine even consider that? Would that, would that even be in the realm of possibilities? Uh, well, I think, yeah, to, to, to end this war, uh, definitely Putin needs some, some, some victories and somehow it looks that uh, they lack those victories and it will not be enough just with the Donbass and, and with the, uh, he needs, well, I still believe that they, they, they want to get Kiev, although it's, it looks, um, it looks um, impossible to, 
to win the Kiev in, 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 in well, nearest time, uh, then it might be an alternative kind of uh, to divide Ukraine, to get kind of Eastern part. Mariupol is very important. Uh, that's why the Russians keep attacking and, and bombing the city. Uh, Mariupol would be one, another small victory, uh, cutting Ukraine from, from the um, Azov Sea. Uh, I think that it might, from a Russian point of view, the victory could be kind of dividing uh, Ukraine in two parts uh, with, a, with a Dnieper river. Uh, and then that would be kind of Eastern part of Ukraine would be kind of uh, Russian territory and then the Western part would be uh, for Ukraine. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that the Ukrainians would agree with, with uh, such a compromise, but from a Russian point of view, that would be kind of uh, um, at least a victory to justify the victims. And then I was wondering if we could shift a little bit. There seems to be, and uh, it just came out this morning that uh, Belarus is thinking about entering the war more fully, sending anywhere between 10,000 and 15,000 soldiers. I was wondering if you could speak to how does, how does the Belarus play a factor in this? Because Belarus is, it's, it's kind of a unique state in the world where it's, it's almost, it seems like a client state of Russia. And how did that develop that Lukashenko is so beholden to the Kremlin that he will pretty much just repeat the talking points that he's given by them? And how does this play into the whole idea of the union state that Belarus and Russia have been working towards uh, for at least a decade now? Yeah, I, I agree with the term uh, Belarus is a client state of, of Russia. And actually, for many years, Lukashenko has been able uh, kind of to play this double role. He kind of, he was asking the Western countries for support uh, to play against Russia and asking Russian support to play against the Western countries. And actually for many years, actually this kind of, the tactics uh, worked quite well. Uh, Lukashenko knows that, well, they, they don't have very good relations with the Putin, but uh, he, he knew how to play, how to use these um, post-Soviet connections and post-Soviet uh, sentiments. And uh, uh, for, for a long time, it, it worked very, very well for Belarusians. Uh, the problem started yeah, two years ago with, uh, with the presidential elections. And um, Lukashenko was not able actually to handle these elections like he did uh, many times before. And uh, the public protests were, was something um, unexpected for him and using br brutal violence against, uh, against his own people uh, that actually created an um, environment where he had no maneuver possibilities. So, uh, he was uh, sanctioned by international organizations, by the European Union. Uh, so he, he became actually fully dependent on, on, on Putin and uh, Putin's Russia. Mm. And uh, now just to save his power, to, to save his power ambitions, uh, he is in a situation where he needs to do what Putin wants. Uh, obviously he's trying to to, to play certain kind of his own game, but uh, uh, the, the opportunities are very, very, very low. And uh, uh, I assume that when, if Russians need to increase a press, military pressure on Kiev and Ukraine, basically Kiev, that's, uh, that's strategically the most important place, uh, Belarusians will be used and, and there is contradictive information about Belarusian involvement, but it seems that uh, uh, Lukashenko will follow kind of uh, Russian directions. Constance, go right up. Uh, yes, actually a question about uh, Russian resources. Uh, how, the, how long, for how long they can afford uh, themselves to have this war? Uh, how much the troops they are ready to lose. And uh, actually about Lukashenko, as you mentioned, his regime uh, is quite weak and dependent from Mr. Putin. And 
Uh, not so far, I have read that if Lukashenko decides to send uh, his uh, soldiers uh, to Ukraine, it would be like the last uh, uh, things, uh, thing uh, which Belarus, Belarusian society won't uh, accept. And uh, if he do it, then he will need to somehow manage things with the revolution which can happen in Belarus. Um. Yeah, I'll start with uh, the first question about Russian resources. Uh, mm, well, Russia has uh, much more resources than Ukraine. Uh, I think from a from mil military perspective, they uh, they have deep deeper resources, and uh, uh, also just uh, kind of comparing from a geopolitical point of view what Russians are doing. Uh, Russians have feelings that, well, we need, we Russians, we need Ukraine more than the West. Okay, the West will support Ukrainians, but uh, they will never go in a war against Russia. So Russians understand it. Uh, and uh, the question is how they organize their army. Uh, they, have, uh, they, have, uh, they actually failed yeah, in the, the beginning, in the, in the first weeks of the war. Now they are changing the tactics. They are the bombing the, the civilian objects. Uh, they're trying kind of uh, to prolong this war to make it kind of uh, uh, to weaken Ukrainian positions. And uh, uh, they believe that sooner or later they will achieve at least some of the goals. Um, I think, uh, uh, and yeah, the kind of the impact of sanctions and sanctions will, by the way, will also influence Russian military industry because the high tech uh, and uh, well, electronic equipment is um, well dependent on the Western markets, and, and but that 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 might take years. Not uh, uh, it's um, for 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 the current situation, it will not help Ukrainians. But uh, Russia has yeah, that they have a, a lot of resources. So they what what they miss actually is. Uh, mm, uh, um, certain order, the way they organize, the lack of organization, the lack of morale, because they Russians don't feel that this is kind of their war. But uh, from a regime point of view, they have a lot of resources. Regarding Bel Bel Belarus, uh, I would say that, uh, again, uh, I don't believe that if there would be cases where uh, Belarusians would try to avoid mobilization or wouldn't go uh, uh, in the war, uh, there the, 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 the would be new demonstrations and protests. I think the uh, Belarusian regime has already uh, oppressed any opposition groups, whether they are kind of left Belarus or they are kind of under total control of Lukashenko regime. And, this this won't be kind of a, a game changer for from a Lukashenko point of view. Professor Smigol. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, so, Professor, um, you've mentioned that Belarus is a servant state or of Russia, and in the media there have been a lot of speculations that Russia itself could become a servant state to China, especially if the uh, Russia continues to be isolated economically from the rest of the world, China's need for Russian resources, but also the fact that China is a strong economic power that could provide a lot of support to Russia. So do you think, I mean, if I'm reading this in the Western press and among Western analyses, I, I would think that uh, President Putin is also hearing this same thing, which goes against the image he's trying to create. So what's your take on that? Do you think it's possible that Russia could become a vassal state to China as China is opportunistic and tr could try to use this to its advantage? And how could pre President Putin try to combat that? I think yes. In the long term, uh, Chinese have much more advantages, and they will. They are obviously they will use them against Russia. In the short term perspective, China is interested that uh, you have a neighboring country like Russia, 
uh, in an open conflict with uh, with the West, with the Europe, with especially with Americans. Uh, from a Chinese perspective, it makes uh, it, actually the situation is quite good from Chinese perspective because the Americans uh, are busy with Russian issues. Uh, so it means that uh, this is kind of what you rightly mentioned Ch gives more opportunities for Chinese uh, because Americans will kind of ign ignore Chinese question at least for a while. Um, uh, also, it's also for, uh, very important that economically Russia is so weak that uh, Chinese, even they, if they help them, uh, the price will be very high. And we all already noticed in 2014 that, okay, uh, Russia can say that, well, we will uh, export our gas and, and oil uh, resources to China, but uh, the price and the costs uh, uh, won't be what, what Russians expect. And that's uh, uh, Chinese, obviously, they read the global market very well. And if they see opportunity to kind of to ask higher price, they will do it. Mm. Uh, also, I believe that the Chinese are slowly, but they're changing their attitude towards the war. In the beginning, they were kind of supporting, but um, UN Security Council vote was uh, not against, not, not using veto or, or against. Uh, then later, actually, they have started the term war uh, and I think from a Chinese perspective, it's very important to, uh, to gain from the soft power. And obviously China doesn't want to be related somehow with a Russian war against Ukraine. And they will play uh, slowly, but they will play kind of the potential moderate role. Uh, and because, well, because of economic interests, especially in the global market, in the, in, in interaction with American market. Uh, at the same time, they will use opportunities to get benefits from Russia. And, uh, and yeah, and Russia, Chinese soft power is very important. And that's why they, they will try to um, avoid uh, kind of strong coalition with Russia. So do you think that then Mr. Putin is aware that there's a perception that Russia could become a servant state to China? Uh, I, I think in the long term, yes, yes. And I think uh, uh, it kind of reminded the Kissinger's diplomacy, uh, the President Biden's uh, phone call with the Chinese president. And I think, uh, well, no one expects that China and America will agree on something and there'll be kind of uh, uh, new declarations of friendship or whatever. But the very fact that uh, Chinese and American leadership uh, negotiations, uh, this is something what uh, I assume uh, makes Putin uh, very nervous. And I think from American strategy, this is kind of the right approach. Just kind of calling Chinese colleagues every day just to, and, and showing to the public that, well, we are talking with Chinese. And this is kind of, this is a way actually Kissinger's diplomacy in nowadays can, can work again. Mm -hmm. Very true. Thank you. Professor, in line with, with, with China, uh, as we discussed last year, uh, Russia's trade with China was only, it only amounted to about 130 billion. But its trade with the European Union in 2021, even with the coronavirus, was in excess of 260 billion. So what I'm asking is how much longer can China continue to finance and prop up Moscow uh, if their numbers even dwarf that of countries who have thrown increasingly heavy sanctions on them? And it, at what point will China reach its, its quote unquote breaking point and say, look, it's just not worth it to continue to back, back Moscow if, if we're going to lose our Western markets? Until they, yeah, they, they, they will have, would have a real feeling that they could lose Western markets. They will change the, the, the policy. But so far, it seems that they, they are uh, getting political benefits. Uh, and I think those political benefits, they calculate those, those are more important than 
economic benefits, at least for the time being. And then Professor, and then shifting to the West too, and if Professor Hollis is on, I would like to ask him as well. Uh, he did some work in the State Department. Do you think that uh, the West's sanctions, the United States and the European Union are achieving its goals? Uh, have they gone too far? Have they not been enough? Are they right in the middle? Uh, and where do you see that going over the next few weeks? Do you see it ramping up? Uh, or as the Ukrainian military looks like it's starting to be able to hold its own, do you see them starting to ease? Uh, where do you see that trajectory? Uh, well, my answer would be, well, uh, I personally didn't expect so strong and so unified uh, international sanctions. And, uh, well, reading those sanctions and also the side effect of sanctions and the long-term impact on the econ economy and social life, um, it, they, they, they really might lead to, I would say, to the change of regime. There might be cosmetic changes, but it also might lead to real, uh, very serious turbulence within Russian elites. Uh, but that's a matter of, well, probably a year, two years, we'll see. But uh, the sanctions are very significant and very, very important. I, I agree that uh, the role of sanctions was they, they were imposed uh, kind of to punish Putin, actually, or to change his military activities against Ukraine. Uh, from this point of view, sanctions are not effective because uh, from a Putin point of view, uh, national security is much more important than economy. That's a way of his thinking. And uh, even before uh, attack on Ukraine, Russian economy was actually, I would say, I would call it kind of the wartime economy because uh, Russia has saved a lot of resources, a lot of money in international markets. I think they are one of the leaders uh, buying the gold and uh, they kind of, they were saving the resources but not investing in economy. And um, it's because again, the security is this, um, security threat perception is much more important than the economy. But uh, uh, yeah, in the short term, sanctions will not uh, kind of punish Putin or will not uh, resolve the, the, the military conflict. But in the long term, even it's not long term, in medium term, I would say, they might uh, lead to unpredictable changes. And if the social protests start together with certain cracks in elites, uh, that might uh, bring uh, new, new changes. Jeff, I'll just I'll just weigh in quickly because um, you invited me to. Um, I, I think I agree with all of that. I think I think it's important to recognize just how dramatic the sanctions were. Right, those of us who teach international law have long taught about sanctions, but particularly um, against a country like Russia, the 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 volume and the speed with which these sanctions were. Uh, assessed is quite dramatic. I tend to agree that I think it's, one, I think it's premature to know what effects they're having. I, the, the whole point of sanctions is they they don't work in days or weeks. They work in months or years. And so I don't think we've really seen them, you know, uh, exhibit the the pressure that they, they're designed to have, right? It's not enough for the news to breathlessly report, oh, this factory has shut down because it can't get the spare parts it needs. You know, you need to see all the factories shutting down, you know, it, it has to cut across the society. And I also agree that it's the calculus on the sanctions is that it may not affect the calculus of Putin, but it may affect uh, those around him or those who might otherwise uh, contest uh, his rule, right? I think it's pretty unlikely that the sanctions are going to change um, his behavior here. If anything, it may help him kind of carry forward this image of Russia as you know, again, once again, being, um, you know, treated as a lesser power and being disrespected and, and the need for Russians uh, to, to, as they have in the past, to, to, to soldier on and, 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 and take these hits, but, you know, survive. Um, I will also note that one other thing about, I think that's interesting about the sanctions is though I do think that they signal resolve among like-minded countries that, that may affect the calculus for Russia about you know, whether or how to expand this conflict. Because obviously things not going in Ukraine the way uh, the Russian military had expected 
you know, there's kind of two options when you're getting cornered. You know, one option uh, is to escalate uh, the conflict itself. And so you've seen the fears about chemical weapons or tactical nuclear weapons being used in theater. But the other would be to expand the fight. Um, and so I, I do think the sanctions kind of have signaled something that I, my sense from reading was that the Russian government was surprised by, that they thought there would be more dissension among NATO and among European Union states that that states like Hungary or Poland or, or even you know, Serbia and the like would resist some of the sanctions and that, you know, that the NATO countries were not as united. And I think the sanctions provide, at least for now, a counter narrative to that. Um, we'll see. They're, you know, they're going to try this week for more sanctions, and you're already seeing stories about Germany being unwilling and the like. So there may be limits to the unity, but so far the sanctions have shown a unity um, that was quite, I think, quite surprising to some. Um, and I have a class at one, so I'm going to get off camera. I'm going to keep listening as long as I can, but, but if I don't get a chance to say thank you. Thank you. Professor, we just had a question come in. Why did uh, the Russian Central Bank decide to keep their reserves in the European Union and the United States? Didn't they think that in case of a war, isn't it a best idea to keep their reserves uh, not in, or in friendly states uh, rather than them? Uh, I think the, 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 uh, the, there were financial reasons uh, why to keep reserves in, in European or in EU or US markets. Uh, and also it illustrates that they didn't expect uh, such a unity of the Western countries and uh, yeah, such, uh, such tr strong s sanctions. I think, um, yeah, and Probably again, uh, when Putin was planning and planning both with intelligence services, with the military representatives, they never asked central bank how Western countries would react, what are kind of Western scenarios. So it was a purely kind of military, military operation, uh, ignoring uh, other actors. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that also shows kind of this, uh, how unprepared actually the, the, the decision makers were. And in, in not consulting these other, you know, key factors or, or, or key people that surround uh, the regime in the Kremlin, do you think it was the, that a, a lot of the Russian oligarchs were not consulted to the level that they should have been before this was launched? Do you think that Putin was too narrow-minded in only consulting his military and intelligence services who were yes men to begin with, and who are going to give yeah, him think, those I, answers? I think that's that's his problem. Yeah, that's uh, uh, and again, this shows kind of the the one of the weaknesses of the authoritarian regime, uh, because in democracy you you could be you should be much more careful what opposition is saying. What kind of uh, there might be opposition within a within position within government. But you have to kind of play with all your cards. You have to plan. Uh, this kind of uh, the lack of planning shows the uh, the weakness of the authoritarian regime. And and uh, uh, I'm afraid that uh, now Putin will will be much even more isolated, and that's increased uh, risk for um, kind of um, uh, well unpredictable uh, activities. Now, in, if that were to go that way, where uh, Vladimir Putin becomes more isolated, do you see that working in an inverse uh, to his rationality? So is he still a rational actor, but will that diminish then uh, the more negative this war goes for him and the more isolated he is, will he become to be more erratic? Um, will he let his ego get the better of him? Uh, or do you think that there are controls around him, such as his top military advisors, who are strong enough to be able to rein him in from doing something irrational. I, I hope that military, well, Russian military will be able actually to, to have certain influence on him. And the way actually Russians have, have changed its uh, military tactics in Ukraine shows that, well, uh, he's not as crazy as, as, as it might seem uh, to some experts in media and, and, and uh, um, 
So they, they, they have shown certain flexibility, but that's more about military tactics rather than kind of uh, uh, long-term strategy. So what, even if, okay, even if uh, Russia wins a Kiev and they create a puppet government there, uh, the, that's a good question, how you uh, govern this, uh, the territory of Ukraine you still you'll have a huge resistance and and even now when uh, russians have uh, 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 occupied number of small cities they are not able to uh, to provide the government governance uh, they there is no plan actually how to how to manage all these processes uh, and uh, that's again that's an example of uh, lack of planning Marcus, go right ahead. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, for example, if there would be agreement between Ukraine and Russia on ending the invasion of Ukraine, um, would uh, Russia be a partner that the international community could still trust? Because we see that under the Budapest Memorandum, Russia should be the one country who would provide security guarantees to Ukraine. We saw this statement of Russia before uh, invasion, saying there would be absolutely no scenario of invasion of Ukraine. So the question remains, even if there would be agreement between these two states, how can we know that Russia would fill the conditions under it? Uh, I completely agree that Russia has at least the current, current government, the current kind of uh, regime, has lost any uh, international reputation, signing all kind of uh, well agreements. Uh, probably, if there would be completely new government uh, with the new guarantees, that might might probably change the situation. But uh, from this point of view, well, this is uh, uh, the re re reputation level is very very low, and. Uh, Again, United Nations uh, General Assembly vote was a good example that uh, uh, clearly showing which which partners kind of believe uh, Russian um, Russian interpretation of the situation and R Russians always have emphasized that United Nations is the most important organization. This is a, a central organization of international law and international uh, international system. And uh, yes, just uh, because of the, the, their own activities, they had lost even the uh, e uh, impact on United Nations, which is kind of uh, uh, organization where Russians have uh, quite, quite strong and good positions. Professor, I see we're, we're getting close to time, but I just wanted to ask this because I know we had touched on this earlier. I, I was wondering if your thoughts on this changed at all. Uh, you were saying, given how Vladimir Putin views Russia in history and views himself in history, and we're hearing about these mounting casualties that are just through the roof for the Russian army through these first few weeks, is it in the back of his mind you think that he is absolutely paranoid that this is gonna be a repeat of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan? from the 1980s? Is he worried that this is gonna turn into uh, almost a war of attrition? Because uh, we, again, we heard the same thing in Afghanistan. A lot of those Soviet soldiers who went in there until they were at Mazari Sharif, they didn't even know they were going to Afghanistan. Uh, so are, are there so many parallels that you, do you think that's in his mind? He's afraid this is gonna turn into, in, into his Afghanistan. Mm that might turn to his Afghanistan, but I'm not sure that he understands and he realizes it. Uh, because, well, uh, Afghanistan was perceived from the Soviet Union as still it's different culture, different religion. There were kind of more geopolitical interests back to 80s. Uh, with Ukraine, it's different because the perception of Ukrainians that, well, those are kind of, uh, they are people like us. They are like uh, they are like Russians, and uh, from this point of view, um, the worst case scenario is that uh, he might actually accept even more victims, uh, 
from both sides, but uh, kind of the changing the um, or trying to make impact on identity of Russian Ukrainian uh, sentiments and 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 uh, from this point of view, it's different from Afghanistan, but. Uh, Analyzing out of Putin's perspective, there, there are a lot of similarities. And uh, it also, Afghanistan was one of the factors which led uh, to the collapse of Soviet Union. It was not the major, it was not the only one, but it was one of the factors contributing to the, uh, to the collapse of Soviet Union. Perfect. Uh, is, is anyone else? has any more questions uh feel free to send them in the chat or, or if they don't get asked in time we'll be sure to relay them uh to professor but oh here we go we just had one uh come up uh this will be i guess i assume professor smogula this will be probably uh one of the last questions that we will have uh, so the question is um how credible is the threat of russia to poland and the baltics uh I think the, the advantage of Baltic countries and Poland is that we are members of NATO. And uh, even from Putin's threat perception, he knows that uh, uh, NATO, that's kind of American territory. That's the way of, of his thinking. And from this point of view, well, the Baltics and Poland, that's America. Attacking uh, Baltic states and Poland, you attack United States. And uh, he, he knows very well that uh, in, in the military conflict between uh, Russia and the United States, uh, United States uh, has much more advantages. So he is not interested in, 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 in open confrontation with the NATO since uh, he considers that well, this, is, this is the United States. So from this point of view, I would say that uh, uh, we are safe, but uh, on, the, on the other hand, uh, mm, uh, his formal demands, because, and that was kind of Russian point that there is no kind of cherry picking approach. Uh, you need kind of uh, the complex solution and complex solution for three issues. One is uh, neutrality of Ukraine, uh, no nuclear weapons in Europe, and the NATO goes back to the borders of 1997. So that's one, from a Russian point of view, that was uh, one package. So Ukraine was just one element of the package. From, from this point of view, that's, uh, yeah, we are kind of, uh, uh, the Baltic countries and Poland is, is under certain risk, but uh, from his logic and his, from his threat perception, I, I I wouldn't believe that uh, they are ready to kind of to start open conflict with the NATO. Great. Well, thank you very much, Professor. I see that we're out of time. Thank you again so much for coming to talk to us. We really, really appreciate it. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I'll turn it over to Professor Smigola uh, and Ali to wrap it up. Great. Thank well, you thank so you. much. Yeah, no, very well done and uh, very, very informative. And we thank you, Professor, for all of your insights uh, that you shared with us today and for Joe for, for hosting. Um, and uh, we welcome you back to speak with us and our students at any time. Uh, this is an ongoing story and uh, we would appreciate your ongoing thoughts and, and, and guidance and also to share with us your, your most recent uh, research findings on the area. So uh, we hope to do this again. Uh, we welcome you and, uh, of course, all of the students from Riga Graduate School of Law uh, to, to visit us here at Temple. And, uh, of course, uh, many thanks to our colleagues here at Temple and to Temple's International Law Society for co-hosting this event with us today. Okay, and 